All right, welcome to the Noteworthy USA podcast. My name is Ben Fredericks. I'm excited to be back here with you on a new podcast. It's been a little bit, uh, as you can tell, I just said podcast. But uh, we have a great guest today that I think you're really going to enjoy. And uh, first, just a quick housekeeping note. You know, we hope to bring you a lot of value with this podcast when it comes to investing in notes and real estate. And for that value, if you could just hit the subscribe button and share the show, we'd greatly appreciate it. And also, we've been getting some great feedback on our newsletter. We revamped the newsletter for Noteworthy. And uh, if you're interested in the note industry, you know, you should really subscribe. Uh, you can head on over to notetools.com forward slash newsletter. I'll put that link in the show notes and you can check that out. Lots of great insights from industry experts, details on our events, recommendations, and more. So uh, go ahead and check that out. All right. So we have a guest on the show today who I think you're going to find incredibly valuable. Uh, I first met him through my Investor Fuel Mastermind group, I think about a year and a half ago, and immediately became a fan because we share a lot of uh, the same common approach to real estate investing through auctions. Uh, he buys, renovates, resells properties, does rentals, and I think some owner financing as well, uh, which we're going to discuss in depth today. And he's done several hundred deals all over this great land of ours and is someone I look up to in the business. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show, Paul Lazell. How, how's it going, Paul? Hey, how are you doing, man? Thank you very much for having me. So looking forward to this. Yeah, man. So uh, we get to do that thing where we pretend like we haven't just been talking for the last five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, tell, tell, uh, tell the audience a little bit about yourself, you know, your background and, and what you're doing in this uh, exciting business of ours. Absolutely. So I started investing in real estate back at the very end of 2001 and started buying bank owned properties. My first deal was a HUD property, bought it with a, with a partner. We picked it up for 29.5. We worked on it ourselves, put about maybe four or five grand in it, sold for 69 a few months later and each made 15K. It was great. So I was hooked from there, started doing a bunch more fix and flips, um, started really going heavy fix and flip into say 2007, 2008, when the market started to tank, sold off all of those, got slammed on a bunch of them, as a lot of people did, yeah. and then just changed my strategy. And I thought, you know what? I had done a couple of wholesale deals in the past, and I really liked the way those things went. So I decided to go towards the wholesale. Went, we went heavy wholesale. So we were probably about 85, 90% at that point, and it's just doing occasional fix and flip locally. And then I started doing, creating um, owner finance in say around 2012, 2013 timeframe and had a couple of deals go. There were ones, as we talked about before, where you're picking up for five or 10 grand, getting made mostly whole from the beginning, selling it for say 25, 30. And then you hold that note, collect it for five or 10 years, however long you want to do it and uh, got hooked on it. So I started doing more and more owner finance deals. I, I love it. It's still my favorite, um, it's really, it really truly is my most profitable and favorite uh, part of real estate investing. It's good to have a different, lot of different tools in the tool belt, obviously, but yeah. um, it's, it's one where you can really be creative and you can really just basically print money almost, you know, you're creating your own long-term income, whether you want to do it. We do some of them shorter term, right? Cause we do some with investors too, which is good where we don't have to worry about the Dodd-Frank act getting in the way there. Um, but no, we, we usually do it five, 10, 15 year amortization and, um, collect it. And it's, it's a huge, it's, it's amazing. When you look at your annual income, you're looking at how much you got from notes. It's, it's pretty incredible when you look at it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It gets exciting for me too. I mean, you look at your, your, your spreadsheet and you're like, oh my God, the, the, the amount of wealth that's instantly created in terms of net worth, I think it's one of the fastest ways you could do it. I mean, Agreed. you know, sincerely, but it's, a. Uh, it, it's an exciting business, but what I'm interested in is like you, you started out locally when you buy nationally, like I do, you know, in my other business, um, how, where did you make that leap to that piece? Like where, where did that come from? 2009, I started to, so we were obviously in the Philadelphia market in that area and say we would buy anything from uh, an hour or two way potentially up to the Pocono mountains. Uh, which we didn't do a whole lot of at the time. Then we started picking up deals in Pittsburgh, which is five hours west of us, Western PA. And we started doing really well with those ones out there. And then we started hitting Eastern Ohio. Then we started hitting New Jersey and then Delaware and then Virginia. And as I'm doing this, I'm like, one, it's fun because I'm learning new markets here. It's exciting with that. I really enjoyed that. I'm like, well, why don't I just keep going? Then hit the Carolinas, 
Georgia, Florida, Texas. I started going everywhere to the point where I've bought in 44 out of the 50 states now, which is crazy. That's awesome. If you think about it, yeah. Yeah. I, I, what, do you think it's just the, the experience of getting one done where you built the confidence? Because I, yeah. I get this question all the time, and you probably do too. Oh, it's yeah. Like, how, how are you buying these without ever stepping foot in them? Like, you know, and people look at you like you're a crazy person. You know, what's, what's, uh, was it just a progression of confidence for you at that point? Or was it, all right, I'm going to take a leap of faith here. If I buy it at the right price, I can't screw this up. That's, you hit the nail on the head right there, right? So it was, yes, it was a progression of con confidence and kind of understanding how to deal with out-of-town investors. But a lot of it was, man, this is a smoking hot deal. I'll pick it up in St. Louis. I know I'm going to move it. It's the cheapest thing that, that it's sold in the last six months out there. So I know I'm going to move this thing. So confidence is part of it. It's just finding a deal. And, and you're like me. It, the deal is wherever it is, right? You'll find a deal, whatever market it's in. If it's in Arkansas, rural Arkansas, you're still going to pick it up if it's a deal, right? It doesn't yeah. really matter where it is. Um, so it was, and we do, man, we got so many investors I remember when we got one in Spokane, Washington, and a guy called us. And he's like, how do you do, how do you buy out of state sight unseen? I'm like, honestly, dude, it's not that hard. It really isn't with the tools we have today. In 2009, we didn't have the tools we have now, right? We have yeah. every tool imaginable. To me now, it's so simple to do. Um, the learning curve is much shorter now than it was when we started doing this here. But, it, you know, it's part confidence, part just knowing this is a deal and you know it's a deal. And you talk to, if there's an agent on it, a realtor, you talk to them, find out what the value is on the property. If they say, hey, I think the as this value is 60000 you're picking up for forty. you know you got a deal. Right? Yeah. It's pretty easy on that. It's a lot of it, a lot of the heavy lifting can be done by the realtors out there too. But most of it's your own due diligence, scraping and figuring out what the ARV is, the as is value. Sure. So if you think about a, a a site like auction.com, right? There'd be thousands of properties on there that you can take a yeah. look at. It, it, do you analyze specific markets to say, like I have a lot of friends that are in the turnkey business and we have mutual friends that do that as well through Investor Fuel, where they're just like, all right, I know the economics of this particular city and this, this, and this, and they, they stay in that particular market. Have you invested into that or is it always about the pricing of the deal and you know, damn everything else? It's always about the pricing of the deal to me. Um, there are certain markets I really do like, and you're probably in a similar boat. I love the Carolinas. I love yeah. Ohio and Indiana. We do real well in PA. I love Texas. Um, there's just certain areas that you really do get an affinity for and really enjoy. Yeah. Um, I've done a lot more in New Mexico. <laughs> I did six deals in Wyoming in the past year. I had never done a deal in Wyoming before that. But yeah. you understand these little small towns and the way they got that there's, even there's only 552,000 people live in a state in these towns are still high demand because there's just not a whole lot of housing. Sure. It's probably not enough. Right. So we're in a moving them just as easy as we're moving them in, in a major city. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny about the small towns. I, I come from a small area in Iowa, you know, and one of the things that stuck with me is that a lot of people don't leave. So, you know, and so knowing that if you buy in these small towns, you know, there's going to be people there that are interested. In fact, they've probably had their eye on the property for a, a significant amount of time. And for whatever reason, they couldn't buy it, or maybe they didn't have the opportunity to buy it. And when we can come in and present an owner financing opportunity, they're thrilled. Like, they're just like, oh my God, I have a chance here to, to buy a home. I get to stay near my family and, and, you know, actually have something for myself. And uh, I think that's one of the more gratifying pieces of what we do. Like it's really, enjoy it makes it enjoyable. Absolutely. I agree. And, and you're hitting a nail on the head there. It seems like a lot of these great owner finance deals you get in these rural small markets like that, where one, you have an opportunity, you're getting it usually at a discount because you don't have a lot of competition in those markets. That's the first thing. And the second thing is, like you said, people will overvalue their own area. So so you could sell something that you picked up maybe for 20,000, you might be able to sell for 45, 50 to them with owner finance, get a good chunk of change down and have a really nice spread on it. So that I, I think those markets are very ideal for owner financing. Um, obviously the Carolinas, we've done several down in those areas too that we've done well there. Um, but yeah, it's, it's amazing. There's a little small, little small towns as Larry Goins calls it, small town USA. Yeah, man. Yeah, Larry, he's a trip because I, I that was one of the things I really kind of took away from him was that, you know, it, it's like people are dug into those areas and they're yeah. just not going to go. I mean, that, 
that's where they were raised. That's what they love. And there's nothing wrong with that. I just, nothing at all. Yeah. You know, so it, it's good to serve those communities. And quite frankly, you look at a big market like Philly or, or, you know, even Pittsburgh or places that are near you, there's a heavy amount of competition and like to get good deals, you're really fighting tooth and nails to get those. And our mantra has always been, you know, live where you want to live, invest where it makes sense. And sometimes you got to go outside of your area. But I think a lot of people struggle with that big leap of faith that you have to take where it's like, Oh my God, I'm not going to know anything about this deal. And you know, and that it, it is intimidating when you first start, like I'm sure like those first couple of deals that you did, maybe even every now and again, I still get that feeling. And I don't know if it's a bad feeling. It's almost like an adrenaline rush where you're like, all right, what's this going to be? Like, yeah. is it going to, you know, is it going to be a killer or is it, am I going to get killed? And <laughs> you just kind of, yeah. You just kind of expect that's going to happen. Like, you know, all right, I'm going to get bit in the ass on maybe 10% of these, right. but the, the rest are going to work out great. So it's a fun business. So take me back before real estate. Like what, what was your, what were you doing professionally before investing? So I started out in commercial banking. I was a, an underwriter for okay. commercial loans. Um, then I became a business development officer. So I was out there hitting the streets, trying to bring new business in, get lines of credit, you know, commercial yeah. finance and all that kind of thing. Um, but before that, when, when I was in college, I went to, to Drexel, I worked for my uncle from say junior high all through college doing contracting work. So he would buy properties um, say a duplex and a, and a quadruplex, the two ones that I really worked on a lot with him, he'd renovate them and rent them out. So that got my interest in real estate right there. He's a buy and hold guy. He doesn't really sell anything. We're doing a joint fix and flip right now. It'd be the first piece of real estate he ever sold. <laughs> wow. He's never sold anything. He's a buy and hold guy. So it's a mentality change for him. But that got me interested into the real estate side. It's so always had that itch going. I liked it, liked real estate. So when I was working for the bank, that's when I started doing fix and flips on the side. I'd work on them nights and weekends. Um, so, and then I figured, all right, I got to get 18 months worth of income saved up. Once I have that saved up, I know I can go out on my own. And I did that at the very end of 2004 when I went full-time out on my own. I've been full-time ever since. That's awesome. Now, you and I have a very similar background in that I used to work for uh, Lehman Brothers. Oh yeah. I was, you know, work, I was more on the residential side, not commercial, but I think that's probably something that has served us both well in terms of like learning how to underwrite a deal. Like you're oh, just hugely. Yeah. The so, underwriting, when you understand that, look, our, our backgrounds definitely help us with that. There's no yeah. doubt about it. When you understand that it, it just makes it us to be able to put a deal together much easier and understand what people want to, when you're trying, if you're going to sell the note, you know, Yes. It makes so much sense. Yeah. And I, I'm fortunate too, and that I got a background in the contracting so I could do roofing, siding, windows. I, I've um, run electric throughout a house all myself. I just won't connect it to the main. <laughs> I don't yeah. want to kill myself. I plumb the whole house. Um, this podcast studio, I, I started framing on this before I had my guys finish and all that. So, and the deck. So it's fun doing that, but it's not really the best use of my time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It is fun still doing it, but it does help. It helps with understanding what things cost and how things need to be done um, from A to Z as far as a rehab is concerned too. So yeah. it really definitely helped me on that background, but anybody can learn this for people who are new and don't have any background in either of the things we have. It's, it's easy to pick this up. You know, we can teach you how to do it with the systems and all those kind of things. Any mentor is going to be able to point you in the right direction. There's a lot of guys who are great, at um, teaching you the process of rehabbing. Fortune Builders, believe it or not, has a great program where they do yeah. that. It's expensive, but they'll teach you how to do it from A to Z. There's a bunch of other guys out there that are less expensive that are better, in my opinion. And I think one of them's in our in our group, Roddy, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> he, he's really good. He's probably the best I've seen out there. Yeah. The processes. But yeah, anybody can learn it. Anybody can do this. Anybody can learn to do what we do. Obviously, when you're new out there, everything seems daunting. But you'll learn it. You pick it up, you baby steps, and eventually your confidence grows and you do more and more. Yeah. The, um, you, you, you mentioned something interesting there in terms of like underwriting the note and you know, how that's valuable for us. Yeah. Because we, one, we know how to underwrite the buyer. Mm -hmm. But on the back end, for people that are listening to this show that might be note investors, that's what they want to do. 
is learning how to, to spend the time to understand the deal is right. really important. I think, you know, I looked at, I don't know, maybe 50, 100 deals before I bought one, you know, and just yeah. tried to really understand the process and go through it. And for me, it was just kind of review because I used to know what Lehman Brothers wanted so that they could take it to the marketplace and sell it almost immediately. That was their, they weren't in the business of servicing notes. Like they're, they're take it, make a margin, sell it and move on. And knowing that how to kind of underwrite that particular buyer was extremely useful to me. But on the back end of it, if you're going to be that note buyer, like, all right, what do I need to look for? What do I need to look at for this property? The buyer, you know, what, how, how are they underwritten? What was their in, debt to income ratio? How much did they put down? All these things are worth time, worth the time of, of learning how to do. And, you know, it served both of us really well in terms of, you know, taking the time to learn that. But a lot of times you're learning on the fly too. Like you, I'm sure there's been instances where you're, you're, you're doing a deal and you're like, all right, I didn't do that exactly right this time. And you go back and you get to readjust and, you know, fix it for the next time. But the, um, what I wanted to ask you about, because you're, you're big on education. I know you and I are both in investor fuel, but I think you're actually in a couple of groups. So yeah. Talk, talk to me about how, how long you've been doing the mastermind thing and like how that served you uh, in terms of your investing business. Uh, served me very, very well. So I started in Collective Genius in 2015 and that's where I got to know Mike Hambright and a bunch of other guys too. Um, yeah. Great players. Some of them are now in investor fuel as well. Both are great masterminds, obviously, and they both do a lot. I'm also in another mastermind. I think it's called uh, not Family, Family Mastermind and that one is for people who obviously who have podcasts or are looking to sell products, that's a whole other different type of mastermind that I'm oh, wow. in because it's a brand new thing I'm learning. I don't, yeah, I'm learning yeah. on a fly with this. It's like I'm a newbie. <laughs> yeah, right. So now the, the masterminds are hugely powerful. The education, you can never stop educating, right? You should never stop. There's programs I see people put out there that, oh, you know what, that might interest me. I might be able to use something from that. If I pick it up, it's 500 or a thousand bucks. If I did one deal with it, it's paid for itself. Yeah. So you never want to stop learning and never stop investing. And with technology, the way it's going right now, you got to be up to date pretty good because there's companies that come and go really quickly out there. And there's new companies that pop up um, as far as helping us be able to comp property. So we got to constantly be on it and masterminds. That's how we do. Because uh, in last, say in the last mastermind, you might've came up with three or four different things. I think you did. And I wrote them down in your presentation that I'll now utilize. Yeah. that I didn't know about before, right? And vice versa. I'm sure we all help each other out that way. They're just so valuable. Plus, a lot of times you end up doing business together. You know, you share resources. They're just, there's nothing better. Masterminds, I think, are the, the best things out there. Yeah. Yeah, the exchange of information is like key because yeah. like probably none of those things were my ideas. You know, those were just things I picked up and you, you're able to, the speed of which you can share things now is obviously incredible from yeah you know, just from when you and I were kids, like that sounds like really old fashioned to say like, Oh, we didn't have this all internet and whatnot back then. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> but it's true. Like it, it's the speed of change is so fast now that you have to be able to evolve. And like, I think, you know, a buddy of mine, Mark Evans always says, Hey, listen, I know people that spend six figures a year on mastermind groups and not yeah. one of them are hurting for money. Yes. You know? Agreed. I know them. Yep. So that's awesome, man. So um, right now, Obviously, we're, if you're listening to this now, is we're in the midst of coronavirus pandemic. Talk to me about like how that's impacted you in terms of like buying deals. You know, is it, are you seeing more owner financing deals? Are you seeing more cash deals? How, how has that changed in your business? So I'm seeing, and you're, you and I obviously hit the same type of things here, but I never stopped buying during that. And I'm sure you didn't either. There was deals out there. We're still buying them. Um, April was a slow month on a resale side or wholesale side, just because nobody was going to look at properties and everybody was just kind of huddled in trying to figure out what to do. May, it really picked up. June, it picked up. July is going to be huge and, and August here as far as um, deals closing, which is great. Um, it's just that build up there and definitely owner finance deals as well. We've got a few that one I just did with Nick LaGuarmo down there in, in um, Texas. Yeah. Uh, I think we picked this thing up for 40 we sold it for 89.9. We got 10 grand down from the buyer and we're selling a note 
I think in totality, it's going to be 70 or 75,000 with everything here. So we did really well with that one. Yeah. Should end up closing out this week, the, the note sale. And then I'll do them like that just because I'm, I, I got more doing that than I would have wholesaling the property. Sure. So there's those opportunities there. Their property was in good shape. It was a double wide on a lot of land. A lot of people interested in it and they're willing to pay a premium for that. And the premium was just market value, uh, that, which leads me to one thing too, before, not to sidetrack it, but you were talking about um, how to correctly underwrite a, a mortgage note. So yeah. one of the things I learned was you can't overprice if you want to sell that note, right? If you, if all the comps are coming in at 60 and you sold yours for 80, nobody's going to want it because it's not going to be, you're not going to have the right value there, right? right. So they're going to give you a huge discount. So it's, it's important to be able to price it, make sure you're with the market and not way overinflated in that market. And then the note's more valuable if you want to sell it. Now, if you want to keep it, it doesn't really matter, right? right. right. And I've done it and I've overinflated them in things where I know I'm made whole. I'm never selling this note. I'm keeping it. And if not, I just take it back. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I did want to hit on that point real quick there. But no, we're still doing really well with the market the way it is. Obviously, there's a compressed inventory, but it's a temporarily compressed inventory because we just had there was a hold on foreclosures right hold on evictions but i just saw i think it was on one american news or fox news the other day there is over 28 million scheduled evictions for september 28 that's insane so you have this big buildup right in evictions obviously people that weren't paying the rentals but also for people who are getting ejected out of their house right or for yeah. foreclosure so you have a combination there who knows what the number is but which tells you and I that we'll see October, November, December start to see that increase. And then in the next year, I think it'll just continue to increase more and more. Yeah. Cause it takes a lot to get through that process. Right. So, yeah. but I think in the short term, like if you're uh, happen to be somebody that's in the wholesale game right now, you know, if there's a lot of evictions that are going to be happening, this is your opportunity to really like try and solve problems for people. Yeah. So if you could reach out to landlords who are just throwing their hands up saying, I, yep. I need out of this, you know, I just got, I, I can't do it anymore. You know, I don't know what's going to happen. And I think that's where a lot of people build wealth is because they are willing to take on the problems that other people don't want to do. They just give up and say, I'm out. You know? Yes. Agreed. I think what you'll see, and I was talking with somebody about this yesterday, that you're gonna have big opportunities for subject to, for people who do subject to, there's gonna be a lot of opportunities out there for these um, landlords, these investors who are just sick of it, they might be willing to do this subject to for short term, right? You know, until you refinance the property or maybe even longer term, depending on how much, you, how much money yeah. you kick them. If they don't have to deal with it, be, if it becomes kind of like a rental to them or an owner finance property, instead of a rental, they're, they're gonna appreciate that and want that and have somebody who's gonna take better care of it. So the subject to, I think is gonna be a big play in the next year for people too. And something I'm trying to figure out how we're going to, we may attack that on local MLS level, but it's hard for us to do it nationally unless we're on all these different MLSs to be able to do that. You know? Yeah. Talk to me. Um, when it comes to owner finance, you, you said something, you know, working a deal there with Nick and I, I want to peel back the onion on that a little yeah. bit. because I, I, First of all, I think I, I think our last episode I had Nick on the guy, he's brilliant when it comes to notes. Like he really is. Yeah. So he, every time I talk to him blows my mind about, you know, something new that I, I had never thought of before, yeah. but how are you leveraging your notes to sort of increase your profit? I mean, you talked about that where you immediately have a deal that you can sell mm -hmm. and, and move on from, but are there other ways that you're doing that as well? So uh, there's a lot of them where I will, do an owner finance deal because I'm going to get like, say two or 3000 on a wholesale deal. I'm like, I don't want to do this. I, I know I can owner finance and get more. I'll go there. I'll season it for six months and then I'll sell it. So I'll do some of that. And I'm lucky. I have a, a friend of mine who's a note buyer. It belongs to a country club I belong to, which I want to make that connection with you too, because I think if you want to sell some here, he's, here's a guy that might pay more than some other people too. Oh, awesome. awesome to add. Yeah. So I'll, I'll make that connection there. Um, but anyway, uh, he's like, you know, just get collect a couple payments, collect six, six months payments and boom, I'll take it and put it on there. Um, so I've been fortunate. I know that that's a resource so I can do that and then sell it and make 15 grand as opposed to three or three grand, two or three grand. Right. So it's all about maximizing what you can on each deal with lesser deal flow out there. I've been more cognizant of that over the last year to try to maximize my profit on these deals as much possible. 
unless it's a bad property where I know I just got to cut losses, sell it at a loss, just get rid of it and move on, yeah. right? Which we've all bought those and it's going to yeah. happen. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, those are, those are good. I think <clears throat> Nick, Nick understands it way better. He's, he's doing it at a higher level. He's doing way more, um, but he's sticking with Texas. So he might become a good source for me for other states uh, yeah. like where, you know, what do you recommend? Do you, who, who can I sell this to? And he, he may know people in other states that are willing to, or be people in Texas that are willing to buy out of state still too. With the yeah. Notes. Yeah. So he could be a good resource for us that way. So when you're, when you're selling off your notes, are you just selling them in, in, in their entirety or are you doing, are you selling partials at all? I did one partial. I didn't like it. Like I get that whole, it leaves too much open. I don't like that openness yeah. of it and where it could, could become an issue <clears throat> or where it comes back to me later. Like I'll sell the first 36 payments and then I'll collect it. I think it could be confusing to the, um, the homeowner on that too. So I'd rather if I'm going to do it, I'm just going to sell it or I'm just going to keep it. Most, yeah. Mostly we keep ours. We only sell a few. Yeah. yeah. Is, is it, what's the end game for you? Like, do you see like, is it like, because for me, I'm, I've got a number in mind. I'm like, all right, this is like, I actually just went through this exercise yesterday. And if, if anybody listening has never done this, it's actually really interesting to do. Like I have specific goals that I want. They might be things, they might be travel, they might be whatever, but if it might be just lifestyle, this is the kind of lifestyle I want to lead. So I actually went through and I priced all of that out. I said, all right, this is what it's going to cost me to have the things that I want and then the, the annual lifestyle budget that I want to have to travel and do whatever I want. Yep. And so that I worked it backwards. So, and just said, all right, let me start with the end in mind here. Like I do with a lot of our notes, like you said this before, like what, how am I going to sell this? If you think about that first, yes, it's not going to be an issue down the road. Right. And so I went through this exercise where I said, all right, let me see what this is going to cost me. And then I worked it backwards saying, all right, well, this is my average note size. This is how many notes I need. This is it. This is like my, this is my absolute freedom number. Have you gone through and done anything like that? Or are you just like, Hey, I'm just going to do this until they put me in the ground. And, you know, cause first of all, it's fun. It's not yes. really work, you know, like we can do this from anywhere. Like you're, you're in that nice, you know, podcast room. I'm in my freaking bedroom. Cause we don't, you know, we just gave up our office because why bother me? Why bother? Right. Yeah. You know? And uh, I, I just had this epiphany where like, I, you know what, if I decided to go to the Virgin Islands, I could do this from there and it's no big deal. Yeah. So did you have, do you have sort of that? Cause I know you've got family and kids and stuff. Is there sort of a target for you that you've come up with and how did you go about that? Timing of this is perfect. One, I am going to keep doing it for forever as long as I can, right? Yeah. As long as I enjoy doing this. But yeah, every six months, I take a look at the business, see where, how things are going, how, you know, what markets have been good for us and what hadn't markets have not worked, obviously, or what type of properties are working out well, which ones aren't. Um, so I look at the note too. And I, and I look at the notes, I look at the rentals and I look at the wholesaling side and the fix and flips. So you got all these different things to look at. And I decided, you know what, I want to get enough income from the note side, combination note and rental side to be able to not have to worry about everything else is gravy, right? This is paying all my bills and then the rest is gravy. So I know I probably have to do about 10 more decent notes and I'll be in that situation. <clears throat> so now I'm going to work for the second half of this year to try to build that up, right? Yeah. To get to 10 where I'm in pretty good shape there. And maybe I might mix it and add a couple of rentals in there as well too. But I think right now is that where we are in the market, I want to liquidate as many of that, those types of properties I can get cash flush to be able to buy more rentals and be able to do more notes over the next year or two, because we're going to be in a market that's in a downturn. Um, so I'm looking at that and, and trying to balance that, right? There's a couple of properties that have that would make fantastic rentals right now with cash flow. Yeah. But I could sell them and make 50 grand. And that 50 grand right now is probably going to be a, to put it aside, it's probably better for me next year because that 50 grand, I might be able to turn it into two or three unbelievable, really good deals, right? That cash flow a lot more than what this current one would cash flow. So I'm kind of looking at it from that perspective, but yeah, I definitely do have a number in my mind and I need to have, for me to live comfortably, the kids, bills, wife and everything, 10 grand just to live comfortably, right? Yeah. To be able to pay everything. So that's per month, per month that is, right? It's 120 grand per year. It's the way I look at it. And then the rest is all gravy. Yeah. 
And when you start, it's funny, when you do that exercise, you start backing out like the, your average note payment. The number of notes that get that done is really not that many. It's really not that much at all. No, you're absolutely right. It's really not much at all, especially when you're creating notes that where you're made almost whole or whole right from jump. And then it's all just gravy. It's all yeah. pure cash flow coming into you. So it's not that hard to do. And if you set your mind to it and do it, focus on it, you can hit certain these rural markets where you could really do that really quickly. Yeah, for sure. So the rentals, I, 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 I always, there's always this debate, right? Between people that are into notes and people that have rentals. Like I'm like you, I have both. Yeah. You know, but the thing I love about notes is like, I, I, there's nobody's calling me about that. Yes, hands not, off. Yeah. I don't have to fix a damn thing. You know, the, try calling your mortgage company and tell them your air conditioning is broken. They're like, you have the wrong number. Like there's nobody that you need to talk to here about that. So that's one of my favorite things about notes, but rentals have their advantages too. And do you think you'll keep those as a long-term play for yourself in terms of, and is that, is, is that a tax thing for you yes. or is it? Yeah. Okay. It's a tax thing, right? Uh, for sure. Because you have to have that depreciation as write-offs. Otherwise on the fix and flip side, on the wholesale side, I'm going to be slammed with taxes. Yeah. Um, and the notes really don't do anything to help you with taxes, unfortunately. But however, notes are truly passive income, right? That is passive income. Rentals, people call it passive income, but it's not passive because you're active in it, right? You're, you're actively involved in it one way or another, whether you have a management company or whether it's you self managing them. Right now, we do self manage them because we are, I think we're at about 15 right now, and that's a pretty comfortable number to self manage. Um, and I use my VA to help with that. But um, the, the notes are just, the notes are just way more fun, and, and no doubt about it. And I'll have to add rentals just to offset income. But I, my preference would just be to continue. If I could, I would continuously make notes because, you know, notes have an end game too. And and a time where they're paid off or cash out or they refinance. So you constantly have to create new ones to keep that yeah. number where you want to. So say you, you want to be at that 10,000 per month, you might have to get to 12 to 15 and make sure you stay there, <laughs> yeah. right? Because these things will pay off. I just had three pay off over the past few months. So, and it's like, oh damn, I got to replace those. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that's, that's bittersweet, isn't it? You're like, oh, uh, okay, well, damn, there goes that income that I was really kind of yes. like, you know, so. It becomes a, a, a larger chunk amount, which is all right too, but it's, you know, it is, I, I have a friend of mine out of South Carolina who, you know, he, every time he sells a note, he, he like literally gets upset because he's like, damn, I got to go back to work, you know? So there is that to think about, like, you know, so and he, he just travels, like he's at that point now where he's total freedom and, you know, and he manages all those notes himself. Like, yeah. I don't know how he does that or even why, but that's a whole other podcast but yeah okay it's like you know it, you you are constantly trying to refill that cup because it's only going to last for so long for know? sure so it is only gonna last for so long and you do got to constantly refill that um yeah self-managing notes and we've done a bit of that um it's better to hand it off if you can just to not have to worry about that because that's just like managing a rental in a way to make sure now is great because i do have people that have paid me directly through venmo and you get that money like that, yeah. which is great, but it's still better off. The note's more valuable when it's, when it's serviced by someone. Absolutely. Yeah. It's much you make easier to sell, right? Much easier to, to handle and everything's cleaner and better um, to do it that way. So right now, even though I got a lot of ones in Pennsylvania that I'll do on installment sale, so it's still technically in my name, they'll still service these notes and act them as notes. Yeah. I guess they'll sell it that way. It's a little simpler too, because you're basically selling the property to that next person <laughs> and the note goes with it. Yeah. You make a great point there because, you know, one, everybody always asks like, who's the servicing company, right? But also it's like, if you're selling something, this is just educational. If you're selling something to somebody on say an installment contract, contract for deed, mm -hmm. I think, you know, one of the best pieces of advice you can give them is to tell them to save all of their canceled checks. Yes. Like, you know, keep all that stuff on file because if, you, if you're going to refinance, which maybe you're encouraging them to do, maybe you're not, Right. It gives them a leg to stand on when they go back to the bank because maybe the uh, if you're servicing by yourself, it's obviously not going to report to credit, so they're not going to see it, and you still have to prove that that person has been paying all along. Yes, uh, you know, so that's a, a a little little tip that you can use. Um, talk about like you know on your servicing, and I just had this thought the other day, and I didn't know if it would increase cash flow or not because. One of my mentors was talking about, you know, at a time like this, you, you start to analyze 
And you talked, you actually dipped into this a little bit where you said, all right, what's worked well for us? What markets, you know, and it's trying to, to fill the holes in your tent before it floods. So, you know, like if you're out camping and there's no rain, you don't know if there's a hole in your tent, but as soon as the, the monsoon comes through, you're bailing water out and that's what we're in right now. So, yeah. you know, you, you try to think of ways that you can, you know, plug those holes and one is through increasing your cash flow in different ways. So one of the thoughts I had, and I don't know if, you know, I, I'm just brainstorming with you here. You know, this isn't even something I plan to talk about, but was, you know, do you do uh, biweekly payments for any of your note buyers? Do you offer that as an option? Uh, for the note buyers, huh? About not for the, I'm sorry, not for the note buyers, but the oh, people yeah, that are, you know, buying a house from you on a note. Yes. Yeah, so I have a gentleman that does that. He pays actually every week he makes a payment to where there'd be the equivalent of the full note. See, so he pays in advance like that. I do have yeah. a guy that does that. And God, that's, I mean, it's, it's phenomenal. And, and I actually got to take it now to FCI and have it serviced that way. So now I got to hopefully make it so he can still do the same thing. He wants to be able to do that right now. He's doing it through Venmo. Yeah. Um, but I want him, I want them to still be able to, I guess they can do that, set that up through ACH easy enough for him. Yeah. Um, but that, to me, that makes it way more valuable to resale that note if I want to resell that note, right? Because sure. the guy's paying constantly and people love to see that when you're at active making the payments on it and he pays extra too. And just that goes extra goes towards principal there. Um, so that is something that, you know what, it might make a lot of sense for, especially biweekly people get the paycheck every other week to set that up. All right. Your, your monthly payment is 650 a month. Why don't you just split that into two, do some here on this paycheck, some here. So you're not getting slammed all in one paycheck there. It's a great way to do it. No yeah. about it. We, we just had that thought because like, you know, if people were, were in the midst of this, this virus and people are, are struggling, and, you know, we're going to have to do some, some reworking of yes. notes. Like we want to keep people like, we're not be like, Hey, get the hell out of our property. You know, it's, it's a situation where we're like, all right, let's, let's give people, you know, the option here to, you know, maybe uh, do a workup where we can put all those monies that they owe on the back end and then say, yeah. all right, let's make it easier for you where, cause people get into the habit of not paying. Yeah, like that's one of the trickiest parts, right? Yes. So now they got to go back to paying and it's a, a, a big thing. But if they're getting paid on a biweekly basis, it makes it a little bit of an easier pill to swallow for them to whether than come up with this big chunk at the end of the month when they're trying to, to revamp themselves. So yeah, that, absolutely. Yeah, we've done that with a couple of people too. Just put it on the back end for them, and they appreciate the heck out of that. And then they're paying now; they're catching back up. They're in they're, they're in good order. Um, but yeah, with that unknown, when I hit out there, we hit a couple of people in advance that we knew were potentially a little bit slower payers anyway to, to get them on that boat. And so far, so good, not wood. Yeah. Hopefully. And that's one of the benefits, right? I mean, you mentioned it at the beginning of the show is that, you know, we get to be as creative as we want with these yep. things because we're the bank. We control the deal. So and that's super powerful. So totally, you know, and if the people that end up going bad, you know, you, you can't work it out anymore. You can always offer the cash for keys and, and there's always options. We're different than your traditional bank where they're just going to foreclose and go and move on where we can actually be a little more creative with it and, yeah. and do more things with it. And you know what, for us, it's probably not a bad thing. If they go bad and we've collected payments over time, yeah, get them out, do a new one in there, maybe a little cleanup, maybe you need to do a little bit of paint and a little, modernizing there but you could do it all over again yeah that's a great uh something i actually wanted to ask you about is when you're buying these properties across the country are you going in and doing any work to them or do you just sell them as is usually as is um there's a couple that will do some basics if we know there it just needs like carpet and paint to really get it shining or make it fha compliant say you know straight sure. the, the uh, chip paint that kind of thing we'll do some of that as long as we're not pouring a ton into it um, then it just makes it even more valuable, right? The house yeah. could be, we, we've done that thinking we're going to own or finance. And then it turns out somebody is already approved for conventional mortgage. We just end up selling it to them through a conventional mortgage. Um, it's fine. Yeah. It's a bonus too. Yeah. Our, so, oh, but always go in with that in mind, try to make it close to mortgage. Well, if this place is a total wreck, it's hard to sell with owner financing unless you're selling to an investor or a contractor is going to fix it up. Sure. Right? So it gets tougher to do those. So you pick and choose which ones you're going to, do for the owner financing. Usually, you know, going in, oh, this is an owner finance deal, or this is definitely a wholesale deal. I just got to resell this one. Yeah. Yeah. 
Right on, man. Well, talk, uh, it's in the background there for you, the REO Auction Academy. Like, talk, talk a little bit about your coaching program, what that entails, and, and how people can connect with you. Sure. Um, yeah, reoauctionacademy.com. They can, they can click on a website, contact us that way. Um, we actually are active on YouTube with that. But basically, we have, <clears throat> we have a couple different programs for students. Your basic one is $7,000, where they learn how to buy bank-owned properties, um, not just on the auctions, but locally through their MLS, through if they have an agent or if they are an agent there, how they can buy them online themselves locally too in their own markets. Um, then we also have a, a larger program, which encompasses everything. This is a $30,000 program. We'll teach them how to own or finance, obviously the regular wholesale fix and flip. Um, but they'll also get, learn how to get and train a VA to, to do a lot of the heavy lifting for them. Yeah. And how to organize their business that way. So that one's like the A to Z. We'll teach them everything on that one. There's a lot of hand holding on that. And we, we sell deals with them. We'll do some joint venture deals with them until they're comfortable and then let them go off on their own. Um, See so yeah, a couple different programs out there. We also have a do it yourself one. It's like 497. You buy it. You can get some of the training that we have there and, and, and try it yourself. And if you're running into trouble, just reach out to us. We've had a couple of people do that. Like, yeah, I'm having trouble moving them. We just joint venture and then help them sell the property. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. We were discussing this before we started the show. Like, you know, look, if you're not into taking action, don't reach out to Paul. Like, seriously. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> if, if, exactly. if you want to do the work and you're, you're highly interested in the game, then you can reach out to him. But like, if you're just like a, a, a proverbial course buyer and then don't take any action behind it, don't don't waste your time. It's like, he's looking for people that actually want to do the work and succeed in the business. So. Absolutely. And it's due diligence as, you know, as we got in before the underwriting background that you and I have has really helped us on the due diligence where we're looking at these properties, analyzing them. You're kind of analyzing them like you are on a commercial side, right? Whether you're, whether you're analyzing a deal, a regular yeah. old um, business, right? So I think that helps us and you got to learn how to, add. it's all due diligence. It's all in the homework you put in to find out whether you have a deal or not. You know, and if you're not willing to put into work yet, definitely don't bother because <laughs> yeah. it's all about that. Well, awesome, man. I appreciate you so much joining me. It, it, it's always a pleasure to talk with you. And always. Uh, are you going to the next Investor Fuel? I am not. I'm going to be doing it virtually because I'm coaching my youngest son's baseball team and they started their season. It goes till August 15th. And during that time, we have games like four or five a week because <laughs> they oh, just wow. all cluster in there. Yeah. So I can't, unfortunately, I'm the head coach of that team. I was hoping to, um, but the next one I should be at for sure. Right on. Well, I'm glad they get to play. That's, yes, that's me too. Time. Me so. too. Yeah, everything started back up. My oldest son, he's in Legion. They actually have to wear masks, which is really tough. The poor catcher and the batter. Once, um, the fielders don't have to until somebody's on base, but the outfielders are free. <laughs> It's craziness, total craziness. That's a whole other podcast too. That so. is a whole other podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, you can connect with Paul at reoauctionacademy.com. And, uh, you know, just a pleasure to talk with you, man. I look forward to seeing you later this year and uh, well, the rest of your summer. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. All right, brother. Good to talk. Right. Yeah.